Hello and welcome to the Arts in Conversation. I'm Ben Hartley, Executive Director of the National Arts Club, located here in New York City. For those of you not familiar with the club, we're a 501c3, a non-profit, based here in New York, with a mission to stimulate, foster and promote public interest in the arts. Annually, the club offers more than 150 free programs to the public, including exhibitions, theatrical and musical performances, lectures and readings. At the National Arts Club, we celebrate all art forms. So for this podcast series, each episode dives deeper into one specific medium. Today, our episode is dedicated to theatre. The club regularly hosts not only live theatre performances, but also engaging conversations with leading actors, playwrights, directors, and other creatives working behind the scenes. Personally, I always love the experience of going to theatre. You walk into that space with an uncomfortable seat, with creaking floors usually. You look at that playbill, that program, the lights go down, and immediately you're joining something that human beings have enjoyed and participated in for thousands of years, from Greek theatre, through to French farce, through to Shakespeare standing in the audience there, through to modern day theatre. And being part of that experience is always wonderful and special. There's a beauty in the spectrum of live theatre, giving audiences access to an infinite range of stories, voices and perspectives. To begin the episode, I'd like to introduce a recent lecturer at the National Arts Club, Matthew Motel Didner. Associate Artistic Director of the National Yiddish Theatre, Volksbiena, who is orchestrating an incredibly unique kind of live theatre in New York, that is, live theatre performed in Yiddish. Welcome, Motel. My name is Matthew Motel Didner. I am the Associate Artistic Director of National Yiddish Theatre, Volksbiena. The National Yiddish Theatre, Volksbiena, was founded in 1915, and it was founded by uh, non-professionals who, you know, these were people who worked in sweatshops mostly by day, um, and they just loved uh, performing theater and were looking for theater of high literary and social value. And so they dedicated their nights and weekends to to making theater. The early folks, Bina, was doing Yiddish translations of works in Yiddish translation for a Yiddish-speaking audience. As it became one of the few surviving Yiddish theaters left in the world, the mission expanded to cover not just those literary plays, uh, social justice plays, but really the, the entire canon of, um, of Yiddish theater uh, as a not only uh, preservation, but moving the art form into the 21st century. Yiddish is a composite language. It is made up of layers of languages that Jews have spoken in diaspora for the last 3,000 years. Um, Hebrew was the original language spoken by the Israelite people in uh, in the ancient times. It's the language that the Torah, or the Old Testament of the Bible, is written in. A hundred years ago, Hebrew was considered to be a dead language. It was considered to be a language for, for prayer and study only. It was not spoken conversationally. In 1948, when Israel became a state, Hebrew was adopted as the official language, and any anyone who was um, emigrating to Israel would go to language training pretty much right away, something called an ulpan, to learn how to speak Hebrew. And of course, in American Hebrew schools, um, Hebrew began uh, to be taught as a, a conversational language. Yiddish was uh, diminishing due to assimilation. Um, and then, of course, six million Yiddish speakers were murdered in Europe during the war. Yiddish has been on a growth trend for you know the last i would say 50 years um beginning in the late 60s when um it was around the time that ethnic studies in universities became popular so at the same time that you had um asian american studies and african american studies you started to have jewish american studies or judaic studies um and yiddish began to be taught on campuses most notably uh at first at uh, columbia university 
and it just sort of grew from there. There was a time when, other than the outside of the Hasidic community, where it was people would go to, to have clubs. They have these things called svivas, um, societies, where you know you meet at somebody's house. It's like a literary circle. You converse with one another in Yiddish, gossip with one another in Yiddish, read literature and poetry in Yiddish. Um, and there were other, you know, other sorts of social gatherings, the Yiddish Actors and Friends Artists Club uh, meet several times a year. Um, but now that we're finding younger and younger people drawn to it, we're also finding younger families who are raising their children to speak Yiddish. There was a time that Yiddish theater was more about finding people who could speak Yiddish um, and uh, and then finding things for them to do. Um, now it's a matter of finding the best talent available and teaching them how to work in Yiddish. It begins at the auditions. Uh, we're looking for quadruple threats. We're looking for people that not only uh, can can sing, uh, act, and dance uh at the at the highest level, but they have to be able to do all uh, all of the above in in Yiddish. So the way we do that is we provide transliterated scripts. First of all, Yiddish in its uh, original printed version uses the Hebrew alphabet. Some of the letters are pronounced a little bit differently, so a Hebrew speaker couldn't necessarily get Yiddish right away. But certainly, somebody who can't read her in Hebrew wouldn't uh, be able to manage it. So what we started by is by uh, providing transliterated scripts using the the Latin alphabet, that's the, the one we use in English, of course. Um, and we provide recordings where we just speak very clearly and slowly, and we repeat each line twice. And so we give them about a half a page of text to prepare for the auditions, and then we see how well they have done preparing it on their own. And then we work with them, of course, uh, dedicating a few minutes of audition time just to give a couple corrections or adjustments, and we see if they can retain it. Um, if they do well and they have a good ear and they can repeat back what they're hearing, then uh, they get a call back. Dramatizing the Jewish experience is really what makes uh, Yiddish theater, Yiddish theater aside, of course, from obviously from the language. Our plays tell stories of immigration, what it is to be a refugee and to have to leave your home and to, to resettle in a new place. We did a show called America, the Golden Land. That, that just tells the story of, you know, why they had to leave their old home and the trials and tribulations of uh, getting settled in a new home. We do a lot of literary readings. Uh, we have a number of plays that were written uh, during and about uh, the Holocaust. Um, uh, one of the most fascinating pieces that I've come across is called uh, The Miracle of the Warsaw Ghetto. It was written in New York in 1944, only 18 months after the actual Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. For, for those who don't know about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, uh, it began on the eve of Passover in 1943. It was very clear to the remainder uh, of the Jewish population in the Warsaw Ghetto, which ha the liquidations had already been going on uh, for, for quite some time, and there were only tens of thousands of Jews left after having had about, I believe it was a half a million in the ghetto. Um, they knew that their that the final liquidation was coming, and they decided that it was better to to, to die fighting back than to than to die. They knew very well about Treblinka at that point, and uh, they held the the German army at bay for an entire month, which is longer than the when the when the German invasion of uh, Poland began, September 1939. The resistance didn't last a month um, when. Germany invaded France. The resistance didn't last a month. This group of, you know, maybe 10,000 ghetto fighters who were very poorly armed, they held the entire German army off for, for 30 days. It was, was quite a, a point of pride. To see a play where the Jewish characters are empowered and are fighting back, not only fighting back, but fighting back successfully. It, it paints a picture, and what, and that's really kind of what drew me into this culture. Was I grew up going to an American Hebrew school, the after school kind, not a, not a day school, um, and we studied the Holocaust quite extensively, and we learned a lot about how Jews died, but we learned very little about how Jews lived, um, and that really was the attraction uh, because it's all there. It's all in these Yiddish plays. Is is how how we lived. Jede Sprach und Kultur soll sein gesund und stark und soll gehen 
weiter in der Zukunft auf die Fliegelach von jungen Menschen. That means uh, Yiddish language and culture should be healthy and strong uh, and move into the future on the wings of uh, young people. Thanks so much to Merle for joining us. The work he's doing in preserving Yiddish culture is so important and we're happy to have been able to highlight it. There's quite a production to live theatre, from the costumes to the sets to the lighting to the casting of actors, but it all starts, more or less, with one person sitting down to write a story, the playwright. Since 1980, the National Arts Club has recognised these creators with our Kesselring Prize, established by member Charlotte Kesselring, widow of Joseph Kesselring, noted playwright of Arsenic and Old Lace, and a past club member, the award is given annually to an outstanding playwright deserving of national recognition. The Kessel Ring has become an arbiter of future success. Past recipients have included Tony Kushner, Nikki Silver, Anna Devere Smith, and more recently, Inda Craig Galvan, Lauren Yee, James James, Lindsay Ferentino, and Mona Mansour. Today we're sitting down with our most recent Kessel Ring winner, Matthew Freeman. Matthew is a Brooklyn-based playwright and a current resident playwright at New Dramatists. His plays and monologues have been published by Samuel French, Play Scripts, Applause, Smith & Krauss. They include That Which Isn't, When Is a Clock, Glee Club, The Death of King Arthur, and Silver Spring, for which he was awarded the Kessel Ring Prize. Please introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Uh, my name is Matthew Freeman, uh, Matt Freeman. My, only my mother calls me Matthew, and I am a playwright. When you think about great theater, mm -hmm. great plays, what do you look for? Uh, you know, I think Peter Brooks said, all I need for theater is an empty sp space. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, one person walking into an empty space can be an act of theater. I don't think theater requires story. Um, I think story can be the way in which theater is constructed. Um, but I think it it requires an action that is observed, essentially, I think, it, you know, because it's not just the action that takes place. It's, it's, it's an experience that the audience is having. So as much as it requires a, a space and a person behaving in that space, mm. it requires some, someone to observe it. But plays are, uh, they are they are not complete into themselves. You're you're always creating some uh, experience for an audience to have, and so to read a play is to necessarily imagine what the play would be if you saw the play, and mm -hmm. to write a play is to uh, create and you know, to envision the finished product beyond the page, mm -hmm. and so uh, I think writing a play is is imagining something happening in space um, more than just writing. Uh, the piece itself, the audience right. is what I think makes theater theater mm -hmm. more than what we do. Yeah, so that live audience, that live experience. Oh yeah, which is uh, you know, uh, over the last two years we've gone from asking each other what are we watching, <laughs> um, to now what are we experiencing, what are we hearing, and I think that was a lot of what we lost, right? That that audience being part of a collective audience. Yeah. We were sitting home at, at home on a couch, or watching a TV, but that shared audience experience. You're right. I totally agree, and I think. What is interesting also, I, I know people who have seen bad plays and have sworn off the theater forever, you know, like, oh my God, this is so terrible. Why am I sitting through this terrible thing? But they see a bad movie and they don't swear off movies forever, right? And I think it's because when you watch something as theater that you don't like, you are having an experience of, of it, it, it vibrationally hurts. It feels embarrassing to mm. watch people do things that you can't connect to or you're feeling like somebody's failing in the room with you or something like that. It feels, it, you feel offended by it, you feel upset by it, you get thrown off. Watching a bad movie, I mean, who cares? <laughs> they can't hear you, they can't feel you, you can't feel them in the same way. And so I think that's al almost, it's always been sort of proof to me that theater provides a different kind of connection because when it's bad, it hurts. <laughs> and yeah. when it's good, it feels so elating. Yeah. Um, it's not uh, reproducible. Yeah. Even watching the same play twice, you're never seeing the same play. As a playwright, how do you see the world? Are you looking for inspiration as you go? Do you see real life moments that you think that would make a great part of starting point of my play? I know a lot of people write about their, for example, their lives and they sort of take inspiration from their own lives. I think you're always looking for 
something in the world to spark um, the next thing. But I, yeah, I think when I, I don't look for stories in the world my, myself, I, I think I look for things that make me feel a certain way. So Silver Spring is a play I've sort of wanted to write for a long time, but I, I kind of didn't have access to it. I didn't know how to write it. Um, it's about uh, my older brother, Michael, passing away. He died in 2019. He is uh, adopted, and so is my older sister, uh, both adopted from Korea before I was born. And Michael had serious disabilities. He had uh, intellectual disabilities. He had physical issues and uh, was sort of a, a complicated part of my life, to say the least. And I had always wanted to write about Mike, but it was difficult because I don't know if I felt confident in my ability to just tell a story about me. I feel like a lot of people go through that feeling of, is am I enough? Why do people have to watch me talk mm -hmm. about myself? What's the, what, what is there for them? The actual event of his death, I mean, there were just so many parts of it that felt as if they, they, wrestle with things that are not only grief, but things that can't be resolved. And many plays, I think, are about uh, resolving conflicts. But I think in, in my experience, pain and, and real hurt from when you're young or, and, and that hurt that permeates throughout your life, um, the, the, the humanness of your family, the people who you didn't choose, but are part of you, none of those things get resolved. They're just a part of our lives. They are who we are. So you're an accomplished and recognized playwright. At this stage in your creative life, does writing give you the same feeling that it did when you first started so long ago? No, it gives me a different feeling, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think when I was younger, so much of what I was trying to do, I mean, part of it was just carving out an identity for myself, but I think now I write, I think, less to sort of to show off what I can do. I think when, you know, when I was younger, I definitely wanted people to see what I could do. And now what I want to do is just make sure that what I'm making people feel is genuine. You know, I needed to I needed to feel uh, proud of myself when I was younger. Now I need to feel like sad at the end of my own play. You know? <laughs> Thanks so much, Matthew. Later this year, he'll be honoured at the club with a staged reading of some of his works. Recently at the National Arts Club, we were joined by a true icon of the theatre world, Alan Cumming. Joining us to discuss his best-selling memoir, Alan shared insights into his life as an acclaimed actor, singer, activist and author. Here's Alan discussing his new book, Baggage. I, I felt in a way slightly worried that I had written a book that was, maybe people thought I was saying, oh, I had this terrible thing and it's all, or the, or the narrative about it sort of was that it's, he's overcome this thing and it's all wrapped up and it's done. And I really want to say to people, it's never done. I think in America, especially, we like to have things tied up and we like sort of stories of redemption. And um, and so I just want to say life's messier than that. You know, it's, it's not black and white, it's grey. I mean, I think everyone has baggage you know I think everyone has stuff and we've all got things that are we're dealing with from our past everyone even if you've had the happiest of upbringings so I just think I wanted to reference that and say it's okay it's okay to be a bit of a mess and it's okay to sort of have it's it's necessary and important that you you acknowledge those things and I find it's really fascinating to me that my father um is much more in my life now than he ha was for many decades before I wrote Not My Father's Son. Because I'm, and, as, and he should be, you know, he's my dad. And I think it's really important that you uh, acknowledge him and, or I acknowledge him and we all acknowledge um, where we've come from and what, and how that's affected us. I mean, you, no matter what, no matter how your parents behaves towards you, you still want them to love you. And so when you don't have that, it's very, very confusing, you know? It's just very, very difficult to go through life with something that's very out of kilter. I really don't like the notion of, oh, you know, I, I, I had an abusive father and so I kind of want the love of an audience. I don't buy into that at all. I do think the fact that I was told that I was useless 
by my dad made me want to prove him wrong. I mean, in some ways, it spurred me on to to be to try and be successful, to, both for myself, but also to kind of show him that I was worthy. I mean, I do think there are certain skills that you need to learn very quickly as the child of a violent, abusive father that are kind of similar to the skills you need to learn as an actor. But it's not really about... I mean, it's about... about you know, sensing the mood of a of a room um, and being able to disappear and being able to discern how you should perform in a way in a in a certain situation. Those are not necessarily positive things that I, but I I can see that they are similar. Probably more carefree and fearless because I feel that. The things that, you know, the worst things that could have happened to me have happened, hopefully. Uh, but I definitely feel like I've got a, a joie de vivre and, and, and an openness, a willingness to give things a go and people a go that that I think is to do with my past. And I just feel that I've, I, you know, I've, I've opened up because I think, well, that happened. And what's, you know, what's, I mean, it's one of my things when I, I talk about this in the book, I, people say, how are you? I go, still alive. Because it's obviously more pertinent nowadays. And I say, well, you know, um, well, what's the worst thing that could happen? I also say that. And I say, nobody died. I say all these things that are little catchphrases, but they're all about being open to stuff and sort of thinking, well, you know, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen? You die. I don't think we're going to die doing this. Let's give it a go. Here's Alan discussing a scene in Stanley Kubrick's Eyes Wide Shut. The things that I talk about are are things that I've, I feel I've learned a lesson from or that, that, that have changed me in some way. And I, talk, I mean that about jobs and also about relationships. And, you know, I don't talk about all the relationships I've had, but I talk about ones that I feel were kind of um, altering for me in a way. And um, so, yes, yeah, so I, with Stanley Kubrick, I, you know, I... It was just a week I worked with him, but it was it's sort of reverberated throughout my career, this this little scene in Eyes Wide Shut. And more importantly, I think the thing that I take away from it is that I, at the time, was feeling very ambivalent about being an actor in general, actually. I was really, I didn't quite, I, I had had, I just was in a, I'd had done a few films, a couple of films in Hollywood. I didn't, I wasn't sort of really excited and energised about the prospect of keeping doing that and, the theatre seemed too scary for me then. And, and all of a sudden I did this little part with Stanley and it really, he really reignited my excitement about acting. I just I had such fun with him. And I, every single time we went for a take, I mean, it's a tiny scene, it's only a few minutes. Every second of it is packed with nuance. And that was because, you know, we, every single time I went for a take, I knew exactly why and what detail I was trying to, polish or hone or change and I feel that's something that it's it's hard to describe to people who don't aren't used to that but like you you know when you do films or tv like you just do a take you don't know why you're doing it again they just don't tell you it might be a technical reason again you know just again like a sort of a dog doing a trick I mean sometimes you just do it a few times because on television especially it's you know fast 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 you just got to have it done and if they get it you move on um but with Stanley it was so refreshing and sort of illuminating to just for someone to stop and really work in such detail on such a little little scene and and so it kind of it just completely changed my whole attitude towards film acting we asked alan what were his thoughts during the writing process i think it was finding the sort of structure for it. It, I mean, it took me a long, long time. You know, I actually, when I found out the thing I wanted to say about don't buy into the Hollywood ending, here's my life in the shadow of what happened to me. And that, you know, I, I've learned these lessons. Here are lessons I've learned, really. I found when I, it was really last year during the pandemic when I had enough time to really focus on looking at it from a from above and looking at it on a much sort of bigger scale rather than just doing little bits at a time. So I think that was that was the hardest thing was to to find out the sort of shape of it. I knew what the ingredients were. I just didn't know what the which cake I was making. I don't follow the thing of 
some people say, oh, just every day, just write something. I don't, I don't think that's a good idea. I think only write when you've got something to say. I mean, at least, and I do think it's just important to sit at your desk, even if you don't write, even if you just sort of Google things. I think just actually making the commitment to be in a room and thinking. But I don't, I, I think it's important to understand that, to be brutal and like, just think, oh, that should go. That should just totally go. And then to also be able to sort of stand up for yourself. I mean, I think that's the thing as you get older. You think, no, I want to have that in. You know, I want that. Uh, I, want, I like that bit. But I think also just flings, be prepared to fling things away. Thanks to Alan for an amazing event. And finally, as is tradition, we close this episode with a profile of one of our many fascinating National Arts Club members. In keeping with today's theme, we'd like to introduce you to Tony-winning actress Lena Hall. A newer member of the club, Lena has a long career on Broadway. Her appearances include Cats, Kinky Boots, and Hedwig and the Angry Inch opposite Neil Patrick Harris, for which she won Tony for Best Featured Actress in 2014. Here's Lena. Hi, my name is Lena Hall. I am a Tony Award winner. I've been on Broadway since 1999 and am a member here at the National Arts Club, which is really cool. I did not know about the National Arts Club. And then I looked more into it and I was like, why, why have I never heard about it? I had only ever heard about Soho House and things like that. And I was like, this is way cooler than Soho House. It's got much more history. It's here, it's like totally a different vibe. And I thought, oh, I'd love to be a part of it. I've been extremely privy and up to the beautiful like art exhibits and there's a student art exhibit now being a part of an arts community where it's not it's not a hustle it's it's about the enjoyment of really beautiful things and beautiful art and beautiful plays and beautiful things just a place to make that happen but I grew up doing ballet. I was supposed to be a ballerina. I was in scholarship at San Francisco Ballet. I went to France to study ballet. I went all over the place. And at the tender age of 12, I decided I was burnt out and that was enough. Uh, And my sister was doing musical theater. So I saw her do musical theater and I thought, oh my God, I wanna do that. So that's how I ended up doing musical theater. I auditioned for Cats when I was 17. Um, The touring company had come through California, through San Francisco, and a friend of mine was like, you have to come audition for this in like an hour. They're seeing girls. I was like, great. I went and auditioned, and I ended up booking it like right when I turned 18, left home, never went back. So did the tour of Cats for like a year and three months, and then they transferred me to Broadway. It's it's a hard business because you're constantly faced with rejection, right? The, The balance of the everyday rejection to the balance of when you get to work is pretty out of whack because no matter what you will hear that the rejection part will be the bigger part of your career (laughs) than the wins but i think the most rewarding part and this why i keep going through the same thing over and over again like an insane person um is because telling story through someone else's eyes. The characters I've gotten to play have been incredible. Um, especially now, later in my career, when I, I, I'm, now that I get to play characters and break them down and find their flaws and highlight the flaws because I feel like flaws are what people are more drawn to and will relate more with is the flawed character. And then, of course, there's nothing like being in front of a live audience. They're laughing. That that it's performing live for me is the closest thing I will ever come to being fully enlightened, having a th- that cathartic response, that cathartic moment where I've gone so into the moment that everything else goes away, and it's just this connection that I have with the audience. It's very special to me. I did Cats, 42nd Street, Dracula the Musical, Tarzan (laughs) the Musical, Kinky Boots, (laughs) and then Hedwig and the Angry Inch, which I won a Tony Award for with Neil Patrick Harris. I saw Hedwig and the Angry Inch in 1999 with my sister. We had free tickets. 
Um, and it was one of those moments where you, your eyes are like opened to a new style of theater. Um, I didn't know theater could so beautifully mold together storytelling and real rock music, not musical theater rock as a difference. <laughs> uh, it was just so masterfully done. And so when I heard it was coming to Broadway, I was in, I was in Kinky Boots at the time. Um, and I told my agents, I was just like, I have to do the show. So you're either going to get me an audition or I'm going to go to the open call. I don't care. I need to be seen. Um, so I had a, a good handle on the material and what it required to play that part. So I went to all my auditions as a man, but I had a huge epic callback with John Cameron Mitchell and the whole team. And I had to do an improv scene. I had to tell, I had to tell a story and I had to do all this music and all that kind of stuff. And I nailed it and I got the job, which is great. It was probably, it was one of the most exciting experiences of putting on a show that I've ever had because, um, well, I was largely ignored. <laughs> because it was really all about Neil. My mother and father saw the show and um, this is before any Tony thing or any of that. My parents, they were like, we couldn't find you for a really long time. And then we realized it was you when you sang something and it was much, it sounded like you. And then when like the Tony noms came out, I was shocked that I got nominated because I thought I was in the dark the whole time. People didn't know that I was the same person. Like, And, uh, and then um, sitting there in my seat, I wore this Zach Posen gown, which was beautiful. Um, it was very, very tight um, around my legs. And, uh, and, and I also couldn't really sit up in a seat. So I was like seated back like crouched in my seat and I hadn't really written a speech because I didn't think I was going to win so I had kind of like jotted some names down really quick and then like wrote some paragraph of something that you know was for Facebook you know like <laughs> nothing interesting and uh, and when they called my name I was so just completely shocked my boyfriend was sitting next to me at the time and I just like completely ignored him. I was just like running for the stage. And um, and when I went up the stairs, thank God they cut away. But when I was going up the stairs, I couldn't get up the stairs because my dress was too tight and I didn't, you know, and I, and I was completely shocked. So I wasn't breathing. And uh, I basically had a panic attack when I hit the stage and um, I gave a very insane hurried speech and um but i will take away that hugh jackman told me backstage before we were gonna perform our number right after i won he looked at me and he was just like that was the best tony speech i've ever heard and i said i don't even know what i said <laughs> i like blacked out um when i did my tony speech Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Arts in Conversation. Future episodes will be released on the 15th of each month, so be sure to subscribe and listen next month for our episode all about photography. The Arts in Conversation is produced by Emily Charish from Charish Sounds. Charish Sounds produces branded podcasts for businesses. The Arts in Conversation is also produced by Mitch Case from the National Arts Club. We'd also like to say a special thanks to Michael Parva, Artistic Director of the Directors' Company in New York City, who has been the Artistic Director of the Kessel Ring Prize since its inception. A special thanks to Michael and the entire Kessel Ring Committee. We look forward to having you with us again next month. <laughs>